we repeat the terms noble truth, nobly pulled path, to the point where the word noble there seems to lose all of its meaning. It's good to stop and think about what it does mean. Part of its meaning comes from the fact that it's in the context of what the Buddha said was the noble search for happiness. Where instead of searching for happiness in things that age, grow ill, and die, things that will leave us, or that we will leave, we search for happiness in what doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die. In other words, we search for happiness that doesn't let us down. And it requires that we take a noble attitude toward our suffering, instead of blaming other people, or blaming the stars, blaming the Creator of the universe. We don't blame, we just try to understand where it comes from and realize that it comes from within us. The suffering itself is our clinging, and it's caused by our craving. When we understand suffering that way, we're taking a noble attitude toward it. The same with the path. We take responsibility for our suffering, and we take responsibility for putting an end to it. We realize that we've been mistaken, and we see our mistakes, admit our mistakes, and in the foolish ways we've been looking for happiness, causing a lot of unnecessary suffering for ourselves and for other people. And so we take a noble attitude to, toward the whole problem of suffering. And the important thing is that taking the noble attitude works. It's not just noble ideas, noble sentiments. It's pragmatic. It's when you take a grubby attitude towards happiness, just grasping whatever you can. That's what doesn't work. You take the noble attitude, and your search really does lead to something satisfactory. I've been thinking about this because yesterday I gave a talk on the topic of fear and anxiety and how you overcome fear and anxiety by recognizing that there are some fears that really are worth fearing and others that are not. And I framed it in the context of rebirth. If you look at all the many lifetimes you've been through, you see again and again and again the things that you love, the things you hold on to. Get taken away from you, or you leave them. Things like wealth, your health, your relatives, your family. And the question is not so much whether you'll be separated from them. You will be separated from them. The question then becomes, well, how do you take advantage of them when you're not yet separated? Think of a John Cha's image of the broken cup. He picked up a good cup one day and told his listeners, this cup is already broken. And then he explained himself, saying that we know someday the cup is going to break. And this doesn't mean that you use it casually or carelessly. You realize you can get some good out of the cup, so you take care of it. But there will come a day when it breaks, and you shouldn't be surprised. The fact that you've used it well means that you don't regret when it's broken. The fact that you've cared for it means that you don't have to blame yourself when it breaks. And that way you engage with a cup in a way that leads to the least amount of suffering. It's the same with your wealth, with your health, with your relatives. With your wealth, you try to use it well. As the Buddha said, loss of wealth, loss of health, loss of your relatives is relatively minor compared to a loss of right view and loss of your virtue. But it doesn't say that these things are totally worthless. After all, you can use your wealth to develop the, the perfection of generosity. 
You don't have to give it all away. In fact, he doesn't recommend giving it all away. He says you use it to provide for your own enjoyment, for the enjoyment of your family. To put some away for the future, but then also to give it, to be generous with it. And the day will come when you don't have any wealth. It's taken away for one reason or another. But you look back on the times when you did have it, and you realize, well, you got good use out of it, particularly as you use it to develop the perfection of generosity. You've got an inner wealth now. That is, the ties say, can't be burned by fire, can't be washed away by floods. You've made a good exchange. The same with your health. The Buddha recognizes that health is very useful for the practice. The body gets weak. It's more difficult to practice. It's not impossible, but it's a lot easier to put out the effort that's required when the body is strong. So you look after the body. In the Vinaya, the monk's rules, there's a very large section devoted to medical care. The Buddha recognized that some illnesses respond to medicine, others don't. But when the medicines are available, use them. You can think of that story with the John Mun that John Furan told, when there'd be a monk who would be sick and there was no medicine. And if the monk asked for medicine, John Mun would scold him. He'd say, what kind of meditator are you? Use your discernment to deal with the, the pain, to deal with the suffering. But if there was medicine and the monk refused to take it, John Mun would scold him again. Why are you making yourself a difficult person to look after? Sounds like you get scolded either way. Of course, if you take your desires in line with what's available. If the medicine is available, use it. If it's not, learn to use what resources you do have. Like a John Lee, when he had that heart attack, he used his breath, he used his concentration to heal himself so that he could continue practicing. So you look after your wealth, you look after your health. You look after your relatives, you take good care of them, and you try to engage with them as best you can. If they're junior to you, you try to teach them. If they're senior to you, you try to help them. Make sure that you have goodwill for them all the time, even when they're difficult, even when you're difficult. And that way, when the time comes to leave, there's a minimum of regret. The point being that you know you're going to lose these things someday, but you don't want to lose your virtue or your right view in trying to hang on to them, because even as you hang on, they get taken away, and then you've lost everything. Virtue, right view, these things you don't have to lose. You can lose them only if you abandon them. Otherwise, they're yours. So you want to maintain them. And there's a strong sense of well-being that comes with that. A strong sense of your own nobility. I explained this to the group in Brazil yesterday. And the question came at the end, well, this all sounds very noble, but how about real practical advice on how to deal with fear and anxiety? The question, of course, missed the whole point. Taking the noble approach to fear and anxiety is what allows you to overcome it. Taking the noble approach is what works. Noble is pragmatic. Nobility is the best policy. When you can be inspired by your own behavior, there's a strong sense of well-being that comes with that. So trying to take the noble attitude toward the fact that the world is swept away, and the things we love and the people we love are going to get swept away as well. But make sure your virtue doesn't get swept away, your right view doesn't get swept away. Maintain something solid inside. There was a story that appeared in the newspapers a while back. A young man in Iran was murdered. 
They caught the murderer, tried him, found him guilty. And apparently in Islamic law, it's, it's the right of the parents of a deceased to decide whether or not the death sentence would be carried out or not. And the mother had decided she wanted to see it carried out, so that justice would be done. But she started having dreams. Her son came to her, Mom, Mom, don't go for revenge. Forgive the guy. And as she had later told newspaper reporters, she didn't want to have those dreams, but they kept coming again and again. So the day came when the decision was going to be made. The guilty party was sitting in a chair with a noose around his neck. The mother goes up, slaps him in the face as hard as she can, and then takes the noose off. And as she told the reporters later, there was a huge sense of relief that came. It's when you can pull out of this back and forth, back and forth, of trying to go for justice, that the mind can be freed. We have a story like that in the Buddhist tradition as well. There was a king and a queen whose kingdom was taken away from them by another king. So they disguised themselves and went and lived in the capital of the king who had defeated them. They had a son. And they realized after a while that the son was in danger. If anything ever happened to them, he'd probably get killed too. So they sent him off to live with relatives out in the countryside. And he would come back to visit them from time to time. The one time he came back and saw that they had been captured. They had been tied up, their heads were shaved, and they were marched around the, the city to the sound of a harsh drum. He saw them, they saw him. And the father said, Don't look too far, don't, don't look too close. Because animosity is not ended with animosity, it's ended by non animosity. The people around were asking, well, Who's he talking to? What's he saying? It doesn't make any sense. But the young son heard it. So they were taken off to the south of the city, drawn and quartered. Guards were placed to watch over them in case anybody wanted to have funeral rites for the dead. Well, he got them, the young son got the guards drunk, and then he built a pyre, cremated his parents, and then decided on revenge. He went and got a job in the stables of the, the king, the elephant stables. And at night he would play the flute for the elephants. Well, of course, the flute music didn't stay just in the stables, it wafted into the royal palace. The king liked the sound of the flute, so he had the young flute player brought into his apartments to have him play for him. So the young boy, young man actually by this time, <clears throat> played the flute. The king said, okay, you stay here with me. And so the young man did his best to become a trusted member of the court get up in the morning before the king, go to bed afterwards. And the king trusted him more and more and more. And finally he was in a position where he had the king alone. The king was lying down with his head in his lap, and the young man was thinking about all the mischief this king had done, killed his parents. He pulled out his sword, then he thought of what his father had said. So he put the sword back. Then he started thinking again, pulled out the sword again. I thought of what his father said. This happened three times. Then the king woke up, saying, I just had this horrible dream that the, the son of that king that I had executed had come after me. So the young boy grabbed the king by the hair, pulled out his sword, and he said, Do you know who I am? So the king begged for his life. And the young man said, No, I beg you for my life. So they both swore they wouldn't harm each other. And they ended up with the young guy getting the king's daughter, and which meant that he was going to take over the kingdom. And so by not getting revenge, that huge pile of death after death after death that would have followed was ended. And both sides were freed.
So it's when you take the noble path that you find that it's the path that works. It is the practical path. It's simply a matter of learning how to inspire yourself that you can do it. You can be noble too. That's another one of the meanings of the noble truths and the noble path, is that they are ennobling as you follow them, as you take them on. You become a noble person, and it's the noble people who are truly happy, because it's a noble path that works. <laughs>